Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is Episode 7, Reinventing the Dragon City of Ljubljana. This past summer, I spent six weeks backpacking around the former Yugoslavia, exploring communist monuments, old Roman palaces, and Ottoman bridges. But when I got to Ljubljana, everything was different. Arriving there was like stepping into a dream. The architecture of Ljubljana, from sleepy bridges to delightful city squares to romantic churches, comes together so perfectly thanks to the work of one of the world's most underappreciated architectural geniuses, Joža Plechnik. How did one man, at the beginning of the 20th century, come to turn this ancient yet obscure city into one of the most beautiful in Europe? And why is this perfect city one that almost no one outside of Slovenia has heard of? My guest today is Dr. Noah Charney, an author and professor of art criminology. He's known primarily for his international best-selling novel, The Art Thief, and modern classics like The Art of Forgery and Stealing the Mystic Lamb. But his love for his adopted home of Slovenia propelled him to write two new books, Eternal Architect and Slovenology, both of which touch on Plechnik's genius. At the end of this episode, find out how to enter this week's contest. My guest today is Dr. Noah Charney, author of two recent books. So he is a professor of art history who specializes in art crimes, which is incredibly interesting. I delved a little bit into your uh, podcast on art crimes, which was amazing. But because you ended up living in Slovenia, you became one of the biggest promoters of Slovenia internationally, which most people really haven't heard of. And so we're going to discuss two of your recent books, Slovenology, which I picked up when I was in Ljubljana, which is a book of your essays, correct? Mm-hmm, yeah. And you're an eternal architect, which is the publication of your PhD thesis, but they, they did a lot of new work for it so that it's a bigger volume. That's right. Yeah. So just to give you a little bit of background, the reason that I ended up emailing you and um, begging you to come on is I was in Ljubljana and I was, I chased UNESCO sites. So I went to Slovenia and I wanted to see, you know, the Slovenian caves and I wanted to see that um, Slovenia doesn't have a ton of UNESCO sites, but um, I wanted to see the, the a couple that was there. But the one I ended up So yeah, so I went out to Idria and saw the mines there, which is an interesting Uh UNESCO site. And I got lost in Ig and ended up not being able to find the alpine dwellings like at all. (laughs) So that was a fun day. And I had uh, explored the Skogan Caves, which was also fun. But my favorite place is a tentative UNESCO site. Um, Ljubljana is actually, in 2015, it became a tentative UNESCO World Heritage Site. And then they didn't accept it. But it is one of the coolest places I've ever been in the world. And it's mostly thanks to this architect that you are an expert on. So that's why I wanted to talk to you today. That's great. That's a that's a very circumvented route to getting to it. But but that's cool. I love the idea that you chase UNESCO sites. What a great idea. It's really fun because you end up going places you totally... Who goes to Slovenia to go to Adria, right? Like, it just says yeah, yeah, of course. But then you end up seeing these amazing, weird, cool places that you wouldn't go. But Ljubljana is the... It stole my heart. And I, I think... Reading your book. So I walked into a bookstore downtown, saw Slovenology for sale, bought it, and then was like, oh, this guy, this is the guy that can explain this city to everyone who has never been here. That's great. That's my goal. So I'm really delighted that it worked out that way. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit about how you got interested in Slovenia and ended up living there because it's quite an interesting story. Sure. Yeah. Um, I was doing postgraduate studies in England. And ever since I was 16 years old, I knew I wanted to live in Europe. I was born in the States and I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, but I always had this feeling of, of being at home and more comfortable in Europe. I spent a lot of summers in France, Italy, or England with my parents. And I studied abroad in Paris when I was 16 through my boarding school. And from that point on, I knew I wanted to live in Europe. But I was a little bit indifferent as to where any European country would have suited me fine. <laughs> and I eventually came to Slovenia as part of a sort of 
buffet of European cities <laughs> that I thought I might like to live in. So I lived in Venice, Florence, Rome, Madrid, Leiden, London, Cambridge, essentially auditioning places as potential cities I might settle down in. But the real question was when I would meet the future Mrs. Charney and which country she would be from. And so it wound up being uh, during a time in Ljubljana when I was there just for a couple of months, just sort of trying out the city. And I met her. And at the same time, I also met the former director of the Architecture Museum at um, Ljubljana, a guy named Peter Krecic, who was encouraging me to, at first not for me, he actually had a project. He said this would be great for a foreign student to do as a uh, dissertation. Um, and did I have any colleague who might be interested? Because uh, he knew that I was writing my PhD at University of Cambridge at that point in the history of art theft. And he presented this big dossier with photocopied archival documents that he thought would be necessary to write the dissertation. And the subject was this modernist architect named Jozef Plechnik. And Plechnik is really the genius Loki of Slovenia and Ljubljana. He's by far Slovenia's greatest artist, full stop. He was one of the best and best respected architects in Europe in the 20th century. But you could be forgiven for not having heard of him because his work is in Vienna, Prague, and Slovenia. So it's been out of Western sight lines. His most famous work is the renovation of Prague Castle, which millions of people visit each year and they don't realize who the author is and that it's a Slovenian. <laughs> but I was interested in his work um, from the moment I first did a Eurail trip and popped into Ljubljana for about two days. And you can't visit the city without encountering his buildings. And basically any interesting building you see there is one that he did because he has this incredible imprint on the city, much more so than, for instance, Gaudi does on Barcelona in terms of the number of buildings he executed. And so I was meeting this guy, Petr Kvitsic, just to talk about Pichnik. And just around the same time, I met my future wife. And I also sold my first book, which was a novel called The Art Seat. So I was able to become a writer full time. And then I had this option to, to totally shift gears away from what I was doing in Cambridge, which I liked fine, but I sort of had ants in my pants and came because he was very small. And I was eager to try out something new. And so I transferred from Cambridge to University of Ljubljana and wound up writing my dissertation on the work of Jozef Plechnik and the critical reception to his work primarily. And then just last year, it transformed into a book because this year is a Plechnik themed year for Slovenian tourism. And so there were... Um, funds available to Slovenian institutions to promote Plechnik related projects and the city museums of Ljubljana and their director Blaš Pršin encouraged me to transform my PhD dissertation into a lavishly illustrated book which just came out in June. It's beautiful. It's like one of those books. I travel full time so I don't buy a lot of books because where am I going to put them? And mm -hmm. when I go back to Bulgaria, my apartment is very small. So I have like a pile of books, but mostly books are on my Kindle. But the book is so beautiful. I like had to own it. Like it was, it's, <laughs> it's a gorgeous. Oh, that's nice of you to say. I, I was totally impressed with the design too. I can take no credit for it, but there's a guy named Domen Fras, who's a professor of graphic design here. And he designed it beautifully. And then a colleague, Mateusz Patanoso, took um, thousands of photographs especially for the book and also to fill out the archives at the city museums of Ljubljana to make sure that they were sufficiently complete. And he did such a good job. They actually mounted an exhibition of his photographs of Plechnik buildings in Tivoli, the big park in the center of Ljubljana. Oh, wow. So I was totally delighted to see the design as well and can take no credit for it, but I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about Ljubljana because I have a feeling that a lot of people listening to this podcast episode have heard of some of the other places that we've done. So we did the Roman Forum and we did Mycenae and Greece and Petra. And I have a feeling a lot of them have not heard of Ljubljana. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of the city? Sure. Ljubljana began as the ancient Roman settlement called Imona, which was on the trade route between the Black Sea um, around where you live now and the Roman Empire passing through places like Venice um, and Aquileia. So it was a major trade center, and then it was part of the Habsburg Empire for many centuries. And it's a very beautiful city that I think most people are surprised how much it reminds them of Zurich. It feels very 
well to do. It doesn't look anything like the socialist bloc architecture that people associate with ex Yugoslavia. It's also, it's very middle European. It's lumped together with Eastern Europe, but in fact, the entirety of the country of Slovenia is west of Vienna. And Vienna is the poster child for middle European. So we're actually all west of that. And there's a real mixture of Italian, Yugoslav, and Austrian culture in it. It's very beautiful. Uh, it has a very cohesive center to it. In the last few years, it's been really nicely done up by the mayor to be extremely tourist friendly. I think I read it has the largest pedestrian only percentage of any city in Europe. Um, and it's incredibly clean and user friendly. And it doesn't have any of the sort of ugliness or rather, rather the ugly block architecture is, is limited to residential neighborhoods that you don't have to visit. And then the center is very <laughs> cohesive and lovely. It's got a big castle on the hill. But in 1895, there was a very bad earthquake that damaged or destroyed 15% of the city center. And in order to rebuild it, um, there were competitions for city design. Um, and it was just good luck and good timing that coming of age was this very talented young architect, Joža Plichnik, who wound up building not only almost all of the major public buildings in the city, but also having a hand in the city design, the rooting of the river, and just about every aspect that you could hope for in a very distinctive way, other than a city like Brasilia, which was designed from scratch by a single architect. That's very unusual, and it's very lucky that there was such an exceptionally good architect present to oversee the building and rebuilding of Ljubljana. So why don't you tell us a little bit about his life before he got this project? Yeah, he had an, an interesting route that by his own design was not meant to be at the forefront of avant-garde movement. So he grew up in Ljubljana. Um, he worked in Ljubljana um, as an assistant to a furniture maker. Um, and then he decided that he would like to move to Vienna. And basically, the intellectually, artistically curious Slovenes in this period would have all gravitated towards Vienna as the place to be. This is also Vienna is absolutely in the golden age, you know, circa 1900, when it was one of the greatest places in the history of humanity to be if you're interested in culture and art. And he wanted to join the Wagner Schule, Otto Wagner's Academy in Vienna, which was the best place in Europe to study architecture at the time. And he got interested because he saw some drawings that um, Wagner had made of uh, designs for a cathedral that um, he said he didn't like the design so much, but he, he liked the, the, the drawing technique and saw such potential in it that he decided he wanted to essentially indenture himself to this person. But he didn't have enough background to become a full-time student immediately at Wagner's Academy. But Wagner saw talent in his draftsmanship. He was an exceptionally good draftsman and said, if you basically work sort of as an intern for a year and study up, then you can join the Academy the following year. And he did. And he became um, the top student in the Academy. He won the Rome Prize, which was for the best final project that allowed him to travel for a couple years in Italy, which was very influential to him. Then he went back to Vienna um, and he diverged from Wagner in some key theoretical ways. Um, but Wagner wanted him to take over his academy after he retired. But Plechnik ran into some anti-Slavic sentiments and he was rejected on several occasions um, after being accepted by the board of the academy. Essentially, the Archduke said that they didn't want a Slav to be leading uh, Vienna's most prestigious art academy. And so he moved elsewhere after doing some projects in Vienna. And he moved first to Prague, where a friend of his, Jan Potera, who was a Czech architect, um, was a professor of architecture there. And through him, he moved to Prague. He met Tomasz Mazarik, the first president of the Czechoslovak Republic. And the two became very close friends. He also became romantically, but probably not physically involved with Tomasz Mazarik's daughter, Alice. And his main projects there were, was he renovated Prague Castle. And Prague Castle had been a feudal bastion that he updated into um, a bastion of democracy. And that's his largest profile project and largest scale. 
But he always wanted to return home to Slovenia, but there was really no work for him there. Ljubljana was a bit of a cultural backwater at the time. And it was only in 1919 when University of Ljubljana first opened that he saw a professional opportunity to return as a professor of architecture. And around that time, his brother, Andre, bought a home in Ljubljana. And that was suddenly a chance for him to get meaningful employment long term and also a, a home for him to move back to because he always remained single and married to architecture, as he described. So he returned home to Slovenia and he had the opportunity to help rebuild it after the earthquake. Um, he got major commissions because he was by far the best architect at the time, of course, but he also had um, useful political um, friendships with some people who were able to um, push his proposals to the fore and make sure that he got the right commissions to do most of the public buildings in Ljubljana. Um, and throughout Ljubljana and Slovenia, there are scores of buildings by him and they're of unusually high quality and they also have a certain feel to them. And if you see enough Plechnik buildings, you just know this is a Plechnik building. Even if you don't know it, you get this kind of vibe because he has a very distinctive style. Yeah, his style, it's kind of dreamy. Like it fits right in next to like you'll see a Baroque building and it kind of fits right next to it, but it also feels modern. Do you want to kind of describe real quick what the buildings look like? Sure, that's a very good point because that's one of the first things I liked about him. I studied Baroque and Mannerist um, Italian painting and sculpture, and I see elements of Mannerism and Baroque architecture in his work. What he liked to do and this is very sophisticated, less sophisticated architects will directly quote other historical periods. For instance, the earliest American architecture, architects in the 18th century who were never actually trained as architects, but the people who built the White House and who built Independence Hall in Philadelphia, they essentially used Vitruvius's books on architecture for direct inspiration. So that they would see a Corinthian column capital in Vitruvius and they would say, okay, we're going to stick one of those on in front of the White House. That's the more cut and paste version of architecture and referencing historical periods. But Petschnik, on the other hand, liked to create the vibe where the German word is Stimmung, which doesn't have a really good translation. So I just wind up using it. The, the Stimmung, the, the atmosphere or vibe of different periods without directly quoting it. So he'll have a roof of a church like um, St. Michael in the Marsh outside of Ljubljana. And you see it. And if you know Etruscan architecture, you know it vaguely resembles the roof of Etruscan temples, but it doesn't exactly, and it's also made out of concrete. So he updated the materials, <laughs> but kept the vibe of different periods. And so you're right to say that it integrates really well because it has this atmosphere of other periods, even though it doesn't quote them directly, so it's not derivative. I want to pause for a moment to talk about our sponsor, Audible. For you, the listeners of the History Fangirl podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. For today's episode, I'd like to recommend the two works by Dr. Charney that are available on Audible right now. The first is his novel, The Art Thief, which was a bestseller in many countries and is a very intriguing, beautiful novel. And then also Stealing the Mystic Lamb, which is one of his newer works. If you haven't gotten a chance to delve into his work on art criminology, it's fascinating. His passion for art criminology just comes through in both of these works, and I highly, highly recommend them. To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl for your free audiobook. So he comes back and he gets all of these commissions. It's not like they just said, here, redesign the city. It's that he got commission after commission because each one was so successful, correct? That's right. He was friends with a guy named Marco Prelosha, who um, worked at the city hall and dealt with who was going to get commissions for major engineering works. And with Francis uh, Stelé, who was the leading uh, art historian and cultural theorist in Slovenia. And they were very influential people who were able to, to help him get the commissions that he, he should have gotten. There was really no competition for it in terms of quality. But they also have some really striking details that I'm not sure you notice walking around, but, but you'll appreciate this from your travels. Uh, architectural historian many years back sort of did a double take and noticed that 
in the city of Ljubljana, each of the public structures that would have been in a Greek polis, an ancient Greek town, was built by Plechnik. There was a theater, there was um, an acropolis, uh, there was a stadium, there was a marketplace, there was a meeting place. Each of them is like a checklist. And this is not something that Plechnik could have planned, but it's just this funny coincidence because he he'd mentioned that he'd like to transform Ljubljana into a new Athens, into a beautiful, cultured place. And he was actually able to do that. Um, and there's also funny, if you start walking from Plechnik's house, which is now a very beautiful award-winning museum, and you walk in a straight line, sort of north along the river, you actually pass through most of the buildings he did in the center. They somehow line up in a way that nobody could have planned. It's just a funny coincidence, although a Dan Brown novel about it might say that it's more than a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fascinating how much he is the resident genius of the city. So let's talk about some of the individual structures that people might have seen in like a postcard. So you have the mm -hmm. bridge that's incredibly interesting because it's three bridges in one bridge. And I just found that to be like one of the most interesting structures I've ever seen. But it's beautiful, but it's it drove me crazy because I couldn't get a picture of it the way that I wanted to because mm -hmm. it's not... It, just explain it to people who've never seen it. Sure. Yeah. One of the main designs he did was a, a reshaping of the main central square of the city, Pashernosturg, and he replaced a wooden bridge that was spanning the river with what's called the triple bridge, which is in fact three bridges, each designed loosely based on the Rialto in Venice, but they're all set at slightly different angles. One of them is pedestrian design. Two of them are for traffic, for bicycles and cars, but the idea is that um, each is one way, and then there's the pedestrian sides to keep pedestrians safe. And it is hard to photograph. I think you would need a drone. To get a picture <laughs> of it. Um, but he did a lot with bridges throughout the city, as well as the embankment of the river. So I, you're right. The triple bridge is probably the thing that most tourists are likely to see first. The other one would be what's called NUC, the National and University Library, which looks like um, a Renaissance palace and has this very distinctive facade to it that looks like undulating sea waves. He has projecting bays in the windows where each one juts out at an unusual angle. So as you move, you see this incredible texture on the surface of the building. And that's one that, that a lot of people remark on when they visit the city. I don't know if I saw that one. I read your book and I started to do the walk and I kind of ran out of time and didn't have the ability to sure, finish yeah. the whole walk. Just because I was in Ljubljana for a week, but I was constantly taking day trips and working so I was trying to see all of the stuff like in between other things so I think I missed that I'm gonna have to look up a picture you got, yeah gotta come back there you go <laughs> wherever I go I'm like oh I want to go back and so as soon as there's like a conference or something that's there I'm gonna be like oh I have to go <laughs> <laughs> so after he transformed the city did his reputation outside of Yugoslavia change did people in Vienna realize that they had made a mistake that's a good question, too. He was very well respected among those in the know during his lifetime, but his reputation didn't extend internationally really until 1986, which was long after he had died. One of the things that was distinctive about his career is he did not start or join any movement. There's no ism attached to him. Uh, this is a time when the leading or most prominent of movements was Siam, led by Le Corbusier, um, and high modernism. But his style is very different. He has a mysticism to his work. He's too referential of classical architecture to be a, a proper modernist. He was really unique, and none of his pupils matched or were able to replicate his style. And this was on purpose, too. He could have gone to New York or Berlin or Paris and either tried to start a movement or join the existing one, but he, he didn't. He was working on his own for himself. And the closest parallel, I think, in terms of, of psychology is maybe Francesco Borromini, 17th century Rome, who was just passionately in love with architecture and every little detail he wanted to design. And he wasn't really paying attention to anything in terms of his, his profile. Klitschnik became really well known only in 1986, beyond the confines of former Yugoslavia, Vienna and Prague. And that's when at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, there was a major retrospective 
about his work that was really the first one to introduce him to people who hadn't physically been to Slovenia, Vienna, or Prague. And since most of his work was in Slovenia, which was for a long time Yugoslavia, it was out of the sight lines of at least most Western critics. So he's always been the, the darling of architectural historians and those in the know, but it's only relatively recently that he's gotten the international credit he deserves. I feel like that's changing just because Slovenia is now such a, just, I read a lot of travel blogs and travel websites because, you know, obviously I want to see where other people are going to see if I want to go there too. Even though you don't really hear him reference specifically, everyone talks about how beautiful Ljubljana is. And it's because, Mm -hmm. it's not only because, but it is in large part because of his work. Yeah, it's true. I I think it's funny because there's just about every magazine or newspaper has had some article calling Slovenia and Ljubljana a hidden gem. Yeah. And it's been called a hidden gem so many times in so many organs that you can't, you have to imagine it's not hidden anymore. But, it, <laughs> but it's, it's true. They, I think he is getting the credit he deserves now. And, and during his lifetime, he was made an honorary member of the Royal Society of Architects in England. So he was getting credit in, in the right circles, but he didn't get the popular attention until relatively recently. So... Ljubljana is a city of dragons, and the most famous iconic spot in the city that isn't by him is the Dragon Bridge. That predates his work, correct? That's right. It actually overlaps with his work, but it's not It's not one of his. It's, it's an Art Deco period or secessionist period bridge with four corners capped with very dramatic bronze statues of dragons, and that is what most tourists remember when they think of the city. But it brings up a really good question because I've been asked this many times because I also do some consulting for Slovenian Ljubljana tourism. And the city has a sort of nice problem in that (laughs) everybody who comes thinks of it very positively, but it doesn't have a single iconic monument that helps fix it in people's memory. The way Barcelona has Sagrada Familia or Berlin has the Brandenburg Gate um, or Pisa has a leaning tower. And as a result, people have a sort of general positive impression, but it doesn't feel iconic. And when they talk about, you know, advertising to tourists, they're looking for what to show people. And it's not obvious what you show them here. So the Dragon Bridge is probably the thing that people most associate, but there is not a single Plechnik structure that was built that is embodies that icon. Um, there's one that should have been built, but wasn't, that could have become the icon of the city. And that's something that that I write about in in the book. And I guess they could still build it if they wanted to. It's still missing that that single dot on the eye that would help fix it in the popular and touristic imagination. So for me, I would say probably when I think of my time there, I think of the Dragon Bridge. I think of standing in the square, looking at the Triple Bridge and looking at that beautiful pink church. Um, Mm -hmm. I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. What's the name of that church? That's a super question. You're going to catch me here. I can't remember it either. It's not, it's not your... It's on Fasheren Square. The name of the church itself, I'm not sure about. Yeah, so I think of standing across, like behind the triple bridge, looking at that beautiful pink Baroque church. And I think of standing underneath the dragon bridge, like the, with the castle, like, behind the dragon. Those are my two. So yeah. you can feel free to pass it on to Slovenia. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so what are your favorite spots in the city that maybe aren't related to Plechnik? So I love the city. I live in a town that's about 25 minutes north of the city, which means that when I go to Ljubljana, it feels like a treat. And I go about twice a week. And for Americans, 25 minutes, you don't even think twice about. For Slovenes, they think this is like the other end of the world because the country is so small. But when I go in, there's some restaurants and cafes that I like to go to. In terms of spaces, I think it's great to actually walk up to the castle. There are a number of trails that take about 15 minutes to spiral up the hill to the castle, and then you get a great view. One of the things that surprises people but is architecturally interesting, Slovenia and Ljubljana has the first, was called a skyscraper in Yugoslavia. It's called Nebutichnik, which literally means skyscraper. And it's very tame by modern standards. I think it's like 20 stories tall. But there's a cafe at the top of it with really great views of the city that are from surprising angles. So I think I'd like to, I like to take people up there. I also love walking along the river. And the river is totally full of stylish cafes, full of stylish people having a good time. It's, it's very user-friendly and very inviting. 
and the use of the riverbank as it bends past a number of Kitchenik bridges, past all these cafes, past the triple bridge, past the um, market, which is also his design, and then finishes up at the Dragon Bridge. Well, if you keep on going past it, there's probably the least visited but most interesting Kitchenik structure, which is actually a sluice gate that controls the amount of water that flows in the Lublanica River. And it's very weird. It's a conglomeration of architectural motifs from ancient Egyptian, Etrusk, and Greek. And if you like this sort of stuff, and if you're an art history nerd like I am, then you can play the game of trying to identify which details are from which historical periods. And it's rich in symbolism and and very strange structure, but it's about seven minute walk further along the river than almost any tourist does. So it feels like a little bit of a hidden surprise. (laughs) I probably saw it and didn't recognize what I was saying because I definitely walked I walked so far that it wasn't really, it didn't really feel like you were on the river anymore. I mean, you were still, the river was right there, but it felt like you were walking. Yeah, you might have passed it and not noticed because you have to sort of stop and think to look. And the the best viewing point for it is actually underneath a larger bridge for cars. So (laughs) it's easy. You you basically have to be shown where to go. Otherwise, it can become a tricky spot. I'm going to go back through my cell phone pictures and see if I took any pics while I was walking of it, just like, what is, sometimes I do that. I'll take sure, a yeah. and I'm like, what is that? And then I'll go back and look. And I'll have links in the show notes to the blog post on my website where I'm going to post a bunch of these pictures for my trip so people can see some of these beautiful places and also links to your book. Do you want to talk real quick about the two books, anything that we missed that you want people to know? Sure. Yeah, we talked mostly about Eternal Architect, which is the book on the life and art of Joža Plechnik. But at the same time, this June, I came out with a more, maybe more fun book, if that's the right term, called Slovenology, Living and Traveling in the World's Best Country. And it's a book of essays mixed with travel memoir, mixed with a guide to Slovenia that is about my adventures living here and also um, why I quite genuinely think that it's the best place in the world to live and with (laughs) with some well-considered arguments and lots of vignettes that are hopefully humorous but insightful about about what it's like to be here, that people curious maybe because of the first lady or having read how um, it's a great place to visit might be curious to to learn more about it in a, in a deep and more personal way than guidebooks would, would offer. So just for listeners, real quick, I want to point out that on the back of this book is this quote from Bill Murray, which is quite impressive. Uh, he says, <laughs> I've got the keys to the city of Cleveland, but everyone keeps saying Slovenia is great. I want to go. <laughs> Yeah, I got to interview him for Esquire magazine many years ago, and he has this random connection with Slovenia because he's one of the four investors in a product called Slovenia Vodka, (laughs) which is a vodka that's made here with Slovenian buckwheat, which is a a famous local ingredient. And he's kind of randomly one of the four investors because he's friends with someone of Slovenian ancestry who imports Slovenian wine in the U.S. and brought him into this. But as a result... I interviewed him. He's also come to Slovenia to promote the vodka and do a tour. And, and it, it, all things Bill Murray are, are wonderful and fun. And it was a big treat to be able to to get to speak with him because he doesn't usually give interviews anyway. So it felt like a big coup. That's and he amazing. wanted to be interviewing me more than anything. He was asking me about my love for the Red Sox and what it's like living here. It was very good fun. So you could actually put a link to that Esquire interview if you like. Into oh, definitely. The blog as well. We should check it out. So you write so much, like even just researching what's come out recently. I mean, I was in Slovenia at the end of July. The book that we're talking about right now came out in June. And you, I mean, you come out with stuff all the time. So I'll put a link to that essay, but people should just be on the lookout for your essays because they're always really fun and interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. It's such an honor. And for blind answering a stranger's crazy email. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's, it, I'm always delighted. Anything that I can do to promote Slovenia in, in particular, I'm delighted to because I, you know, I get sent on book tours and stuff for my normal books, which are about art history or art crime. But I have a special affection for my adopted homeland. So anytime someone wants to ask me about that, they can have as much time as they like. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. I want to say thank you again to Dr. Noah Charney. My time in Ljubljana would not have been as rich if I hadn't have found Slovenology in one of the city's downtown bookstores. 
I'm incredibly touched he agreed to share even more about his love of Plechnik for the show. For those who have subscribed to the show already, thank you. If you want more episodes, please subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review the show. It helps tremendously with helping others find the podcast. As a quick aside, I know that there are a few typical podcast outlets where we're not available yet. And in the coming weeks, I hope to get on Stitcher. Spotify is going to be a real problem. They don't really accept independent podcasts. So I'm not sure if we'll be up there for a long, long time, hopefully, unless you're listening to Spotify, which we're not quite there yet. Also on YouTube, I have to take a a couple hours and get all the back episodes uploaded on YouTube, but we will eventually be there on a weekly basis as well on the YouTube channel too. I do Facebook videos a lot for my Facebook page and I will typically go ahead and upload them on YouTube as well. So if you want videos of the places that I travel more in real time, for example, last week I put up a video of my trip to Versailles, um, which I went to Versailles last week. And then I'm going to be putting up videos later this week and next week of my trip to St. Emilion in France, which is a gorgeous medieval city that also happens to have some of the most delicious Bordeaux wine in the world. So if you want more up-to-date, real-time stuff, you can check out the YouTube channel or my Facebook page. But yeah, they're both History Fangirl, so check those out. The prize for this week's giveaway is a $20 Amazon gift card. If you'd like to enter this week, follow the link in the show notes to the blog post for this episode on HistoryFangirl.com. All you have to do to enter is be a newsletter subscriber and leave a comment on the post. Good luck! Good luck!